Hey folks, welcome back to Sunday Preview here at Our Savior Lutheran McKinney. We're here for another discussion of God's Word, and I'm here with Reverend Gordon Basil and Dick Pattengill. Guys, thanks for taking time today. You bet. Great to be here. Uh, this Job, this Job reading that we're going to start with, I wanted, as I'm reading it, I wanted to read it theatrically and like with force, because I know God is gracious, but this one, I, I, feel like a, I feel like it's a loving father but he's very stern towards his kid of like, who do you think you are in a loving way? So let, let's get in this and I'll get your thoughts on here. So I'm curious if I'm reading it in the right tone. This is Job 38 verses one through 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is that darkened? Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you. And you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band? and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. All right. My dad did a lot of good, righteous humbling of me growing up. So maybe that's why I read this in kind of a father speaking to his son. So, Gordon? I think you're 100% correct. I mean, Job has lost everything, and... His friends come and blame him for being bad. And, you know, and Job says, no, God's the one. (laughs) But nobody blames Satan, who actually is the cause. Uh, But it's kind of interesting because in Job 13, he says, I would speak, but I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to argue my case with God. This is Job. Job saying that. And then in Job 23, Oh, probably about six or seven, he says, would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. There an upright man could argue with him, and I would be acquitted before ever before my judge. Mm. That's Job's attitude coming in. And so, who is this that darkens the counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> Who's talking about what they have? No clues they're talking about. Right. And then, dress for action. Gird up your loins, I think is how some translations say. I'm going to question you. (laughs) And there's no answers left. And then it's, where were you? Yeah. And we have, what, uh, seven seven verses of this? And it goes on and on for three chapters. It's first the weather, the light and the darkness, the weather, the stars, different animals and birds, and then behemoth and and Leviathan and all of this, and there's only one break in there, and Job basically says, um, I won't answer anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom in Job. <laughs> and, uh, the part, dress for action like a man. Like, that reminds me so much of, like, when, when, I, was, when I was coming into my teen years, and I, I you know, maybe y'all had this experience with your dad and you, You think you want to step to dad in a moment. And then dad goes, seriously? All right. You want to be a man? Step up like a man. And then you quickly retreated and realized, oh, wow, this was super stupid. This was, I I, I didn't know what I was biting off here. Um, And I think we can, we can look at God sometimes like that in, in our lives when things are going a certain way and being, being foolish in our, in our, in our, in our hurt, in our passion. Like Job was passionate because he's, it's hurting, so that can lead us to misstep when it comes to God. Dick, what are your thoughts on this? If I'm correct, the last time that we see God on the scene is the first chapter, or in, in an interaction with Job. I think you know certainly he doesn't. He, he never interacts with Job until here. Okay, so he's interacting he, with Satan. Satan he's he, interacting with Satan, but in not Job. Chapter. So there's there's no really reference of God, particularly. There's, there's Job talking to God and asking. A lot of questions. Mm-hmm. So now in, in chapter 38, God is going to respond. But not once does he answer a single question that Job asks. 
in the rest of those next three chapters, which is much like Jesus would do. Mm. You know, they would ask him something. He says, well, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is like, which it wasn't anything at all what they asked about. Right. He would change the subject. And, that's, and, and Je- God is responding completely different than how Joel would expect it. And the other thing I noticed, and I think we, we both have said this, is it's like, okay, mono y mono. Mm-hmm. You, you said you want it. Okay, let's pull up the straps here and let's, let's get on it. Okay, me, me and you, just the two of us, we're going to talk, okay, and that you're going to listen. Yeah. And were you there when I, that beautiful, that beautiful line in here of when he created the world, that he, he invoked the oceans like a, like a swaddling cloth with, with the clouds. You know, mm-hmm. he just talks about what he did. And in his creation, you weren't there. You can see it all around you. You, you, you were, you, I, I called you out as the most faithful man on earth, in the area, maybe on earth at the time. You, you told, I told Satan you were the best mm. that I had. Yeah. And, and yet, over time, you doubted. Yeah. You didn't fully trust me. It was always, Job, it was always in front of you. Right. You always could fall back on what you saw around you. So that was my, my initial thoughts there. And I'm glad you raised that because it, it brought to mind what I hadn't thought about. But God used creation to show he is God. He used something that man can visibly see and, and, and exist in. Where I love how all throughout Scripture there's so much visual. like uh, the. Uh, What's, what's the word Jesus turned bright white? What is? Transfiguration. Yes, thank you. Transfiguration, the bright white image, mm-hmm. uh, the, the parting of the Red Sea, the, the pillar of fire and smoke, mm-hmm. all these visuals. And in this, God, God is, it's like God is looking out and reminding Job, say, look around you. Here's my mm-hmm. resume. Here's what I've done. What have you done? And yeah, it doesn't yeah. ask him what you've done. It's kind of rhetorical. It's like, here, here's, I'm God creator. Now what, Job? Yeah. Like, where were you when I did this? Mm-hmm. I don't remember seeing you here. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the, the Son and the Holy Spirit, but I don't remember you. Yeah. But I think it's interesting, too, because you get down, and in today's world, we have all the things about climate change and, you know, the cities along the coast are all going to be buried under the ocean and all that. And yet here he says, um, where were you when I prescribed limits for the ocean and said bars and doors and said, this far you're going to come and no farther? Yeah. And here's your proud ways are going to be stayed. Which yeah. to me, that, that, that speaks some comfort into today. Yeah. Where it's like, yes, science may be giving indications of this or that, but God is still God and God is still almighty and God will still do what God said he's going to do. Yeah. And I think there's some peace in that. Yeah. He provides. And that's, that's where all the arguments, you know, fall apart is people want to, do this without God and say, God has no power or anything. It's all us. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, he's the, still the one that provides everything. And, you know, is there some global warming? It appears there is, sure. but you know, who's causing it? God's causing it or the or sun is it. You know, or yeah. allowing it. Yeah. And, you know, and if we didn't have the CO2 in the atmosphere that everybody's worried about, we couldn't live here. Mm. Because that's what gives us a climate that allows us to live. Otherwise, it'd be too hot in the day and too cold at night. Yeah. It's kind of like the blanket that protects us. And so we can't get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we die. Yeah. And people, they don't even see that. The other thing, too, is I think God is in educating Job on this being steadfast mm-hmm. and enduring that I, I was, I never left you. I was always here. Yeah. Despite what your four quote, friends were, were lecturing you on in the previous several chapters, that, mm-hmm. that whole lineage, you almost think of it as the world talking to, uh, to us oh, yeah. as compared to God. That, that I think, what, why, is, why is this story here? Why is there this long number of chapters where these friends are just going on and on about what Joe hasn't done right, you know? And it's the world talking. And what God talks doesn't even bring up any of that stuff. 
He says, look, look, look at what I've done. Look what I've created for you. Yeah. I've created the whole world. Trust in me. Don't, don't listen to the noise. As, 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 as hard as it was, and, and we'll, we'll talk about it when we get into our, second, our next lesson in 2 Corinthians 6 about the tribulations that Paul talks about. Yeah. We're going to have that in this world. But God's steadfast love, as he demonstrates here in talking to Job, never left. I was always here with you. Okay? And we see at the end, he eventually restores him fully. Right. But it's a great, everything's a wonderful lesson about the Christ coming later. It all kind of patterns together. But it reminds me, shut the world off. Mm-hmm. Don't listen to the world. I mean, as a complete side note, I haven't followed news probably in about three years. What a relief. <laughs> my goodness. It is yeah. my, my, my perspective on mankind is different yeah. and much more hopeful in, in how I approach things. So if we can, in God's hand, shut off the noise. Yeah. Focus on me. Yeah. I will never leave you. That's a good word there. And it's, it's a very relevant reminder for today because every person has something they're battling and every person has to wait in some manner for some amount of time in their battle. Whatever stage of life you're at, whether you're waiting on a doctor's results, whether you're waiting on your kid to graduate, uh, whether you're waiting on the birth of your first child, like there's all these waiting times. And amidst that waiting, there's hardship. It's because the broken world. But that a really good word there of amidst the waiting, opportunity for increased trust and faith, keeping your eyes fixed on, on God. Like I often, often think God does his greatest work of trust and faith building through my hardest times. And maybe I brought the hard time on myself. I wasn't like a, you know, Job didn't necessarily bring this on himself. But I know in my own life, I bring a lot of my hardship on myself. And God, gracefully or mercifully, remains faithful to me and walks me through it. He's right in the pot. He's, he's molding. Sure. He's continually molding. Yeah. And then I go out and I fall off the table. He's like, seriously, I just made it. Get then back you, up here. Then you're a cracked pot. <laughs> yeah, get back up here, you knucklehead. So it's interesting, though, because then in uh, Job 42, Job finally, at his final answer is, I know that you can do all things, and then no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. And that's great the, point. It, it, and yeah, and I don't know. I don't. I understand it. And then I believe I didn't put it in my notes. But I think he's then I repent and mm, whatever. I was ignorant. I was ignorant. I repent of that. And then God comes and confronts the uh, the three friends and Buddies. says, "says Job is right, and you guys are idiots, <laughs> and you need to go offer a sacrifice, get a bull, and offer a sacrifice mm-hmm. to Job, and Job's going to give you absolution." And then, then God restores everything to Job double. Yeah. Except kids. Tons of lessons in that. Yes. Tons of very relevant lessons. I know, I know Job is one of those books when you mention it, people tend to go, oh, I know that story. But it's one of those ones that just go back and live in a little bit because it's so applicable to everyday life. When what's hard is to discern as you're reading, especially the friend's arguments in that, to discern whether this is really something that is true or if they're just blowing smoke to try to accuse Job. There was enough partial truths. Yeah, there's a lot of partial shared. truths, and that's the key. Is, it, is this, what, what can I pull out of here that's true yeah. and applicable, and what do I need to just say, um, no. But I think the big thing is Job is wondering, no, why did this happen to me? And God never, ever gives him the answer. Yeah, he never does, yeah. he never does answer it's that basically, question. It's basically, uh, okay, I, I understand there are things I can't understand. That's Job's answer. Which, and I'm just going to have to trust not you. Have, we're not going to have answers in right. this life. Right. You know, but, I'm thankful that it, for my own benefit, like when you said God never answered him, I had this kind of, ah. Uh, Sigh of relief, because that helps me see that, okay, there's going to be things in my life that God's not going to give me the answer on. I'm not going to know why I have to go through this hardship, but I know what's coming, right. and I know what's coming, and it's, it's eternal life through Christ. And so that, I find some peace in that. I find some, you some know that he'll, that he'll never leave you, right. despite what you're going through in this world. 
he is never going to leave. Which is the one thing. Yeah. Because even if you have the most faithful marriage, your spouse may die at some point mm-hmm. and you have to continue life without her. And, but God is that one constant that is the rock that never, and I know that sounds cliche. We say it all the time, but it's, it's the one thing that'll be a constant for us until we're in his kingdom, which what well, better to invest in. And the epistle lesson yesterday said we live by faith, not by sight. Yeah. Good. You know, and that's where we have to be. We live by faith, yeah. Not by sight. But everybody has this, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about. Uh-huh. And God will say, and, you know, and, dress for action like a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, 1 Corinthians says we won't even have to ask because we're already going to know. Yeah. Or, or, and I think there won't be that same desire here. No, there like, won't I be. I need to know now because I'm in the midst of the battle. When there, the battle's gone. We're at peace. Praising God. Yeah, the impression I get is we'll have an understanding of why God does what he does and everything's going to be fine. And you won't have like, like my son who wants to be like, well, why? Well, why? Yeah. We'll have that understanding. We'll be like, all right, God is God. Praise God, I'm, I'm with him and I'm not, I don't have to worry. All right, let's go to our, our next reading here. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 13. It says this. And this is under a heading of Ministry of Reconciliation. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in in a day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. A great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, and patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. All right, Dick, you referenced this one, so I'm going to go to you first here. Thoughts on this? Um, I think it's important to look at the previous chapter, at the end of the previous chapter, we talked a little bit about today in the, in the Bible study this morning. Um, the last part, um, 2 Corinthians 5, um, verses uh, 18 to 21, as we are reconciled to God through Christ, uh, we, have an amp- we have the opportunity and the charge to be ambassadors for him. And so then Paul then begins, since he's just stated that, working together with him, with Christ, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. And the, the grace, I, as I look at it, the grace of God in vain, if, how can I make the grace of God be in vain if I don't trust its power? Yeah. If, if, if I don't understand what, how incredible that is, I could diminish it, I think. That, that's kind of how I read it, because I don't, have, I don't have the full belief in the faith in that wonderful grace that we have. Um, and then the other thing is that... My understanding also is that Paul was dealing with some people at the Corinth church that were, I guess, put super apostles. That, oh, they, they, they portrayed themselves as super apostles, mm-hmm. and they were kind of attacking Paul's ministry. They're saying, well, look, look what's happened to him. He's been beaten. He's been stoned. He's been whipped, shipwrecked. There's no way he's in God's favor. Right. And he says, my... My strong belief in this grace, my strong belief in this power is it doesn't make logical sense for me to continue to teach you and preach to you with everything I just, that he just lists here that he's gone through if he didn't believe it. He said, that'd be foolish. Why would I go through all of this mm-hmm. and still come to preach you and still write, which is probably the fourth letter, because First Corinthians refers to a letter that we don't know where it does exist. Here refers to another letter. So this, this could very well be the fourth letter to the Corinthians. He's fully invested in this church. Mm-hmm. And 
despite all the calamities, he's as passionate as ever to keep the gospel message coming to them and to also counteract what these other guys are saying about him. So why, why would I keep have this strong faith and, and dedication to you if I didn't understand and believe in this wonderful grace? Right. And what I'm, what I'm sharing with you is of such utmost importance and criticality that I'm going through all this stuff. And I'm enduring all this stuff, by the way, for your sake. And they are too. Yeah, yeah. It's not just me. They are also doing that. Right. Having the same type of issues. Mm-hmm. Gordon? Well, he does, you know, kind of building on what Dick said, we have, he has these phrases. It's like, we are, we, we're, we're this, but this is what's really happening. And so it's, we're treated as imposters, but we're true. Unknown, but known. Dying, we live. Punished, not yet killed. Sorrowful, rejoicing. Poor, but making many rich. Having nothing, but having everything. Uh, you know, that's kind of where he goes. He's like, this is what we're accused of, but this is what's really happening. Yeah. We have so much more than what we're allowed to have or than what they're saying we have. Yeah. And I love how that ends the last one there as having nothing yet possessing everything. Yeah. Like that is such a profound ending to that paragraph. And I, I can think about it in the context of where we live. And I think we root so much of our, happiness and our peace and our contentment in being able to have things, whatever the things are. And yet we have the gospel, we have the promise of eternal life and not even, not just eternal life in casual nature, but eternal life in riches and abundance beyond our, our imagination. And yet we can get so caught up in, in, in the here and now and think we don't have enough. We don't, we're, we're, I'm not, I'll be happy once I go to, or get this next thing. I'll be happy once that Amazon truck rolls up and, I got 15 minutes of joy when I open that package. Like those are blessings, <laughs> but that's not where, like I, I often envy the joy that, that Paul has in a lot of his letters where he just seems content despite worldwide, worldly, he has nothing. I mean, he's, he's living like in poverty in a lot of settings and yet he's at peace. One well, Philippians even says yeah. that, you know, I'm content. Yeah. Here's a wonderful contrast. Imagine Paul, as the friend of Job. <laughs> <laughs> and what would like that. Paul would have talked about all these things. His encouragement to Job would have been, despite your, everything that's happened to you, you have this. Mm -hmm. Everything, mm -hmm. this, this. That is, I, I thought that was kind of a neat contrast that of yes. these, two, these two things chosen, you just replace who is the person talking. Paul compared to those four guys. I love that. I hadn't thought about that and how applicable that is to today. When someone's going through something in their own lives, being a disciple that walks beside them and says, I'm here with you. We're going to mourn and cry together. But let me remind you of some stuff. Here's what you have. Here's these certainties. Here's uh, you have nothing, yet you have everything. I love that. Well, and Paul goes on here, you know, the, the whole point was we're ambassadors for Christ, as Dick said, and we implore you to be reconciled by God. And then he comes into our text, and he basically is now, now's the favorable time, now's the day of salvation. This is not something to put off. Today's the day. It's not like, oh, when I get feeling better, or when I get my life together, then I'm going to follow God, mm -hmm. or then I'll go back to church. No, it's now's the day. Because tomorrow might be too late. Yeah. And interesting that he proceeded, I mean, not interesting, but appropriate that he preceded it with reconcile. Yeah. Because un lack of reconciliation creates divisions, which means you would lose people in this urgency that you talked about. This right here and now. We need the gospel now. We need the saving grace now. Don't let divisions. And we need to be fracture. reconciled now yes. to, Christ, to Christ, but also to each other. Exactly. He doesn't go there, but right. yeah. Right. And I think the other really important part is the very last part. He says, we've spoken to you freely, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. Mm -hmm. And then you, re you are not restricted by us, but you're restricted by your own afflictions. You've kind of put some bands on yourself. You ca I can't do this. I'm scared. I, you know, mm -hmm. how many people say, well, I can't get in front of people and talk. Yeah, you can. It's just that you've made yourself 
put this restriction on you that I can't do it, but you can. But then notice what he says in 13. In return, widen your hearts also. You know, our heart is wide open. You need to open your heart wide too. That's a very interesting image. Yeah. Open your heart to let, to, because how many times do we say, oh, that they shouldn't be part of the church? Sure. Or that person wouldn't belong here. But they are because God wants everybody. Yeah. Or someone who already in the church has cut me. Yeah. Well, go back a couple paragraphs, seek reconciliation, widen your heart and grace towards them yeah. for the unity of the faith and their well being and your well being. And what Gordon read also in, in verse 12, we, um, we have spoken freely to you. Yes. What I get from that is he held nothing back. There's no secret gospel that mm-hmm. I'm going to be able to sh- share with only a few people. Yeah. Okay. No, all the gospel has been preached. Everything's laid out. There is, there is no secret gospel out there. Everything has been presented to you. Which to me takes away, stretch, but takes away the hierarchy that can exist within churches. Oh, yeah. Like, it's the full word of God. Like, I grew up where you didn't read your Bible because you just trusted what the church said. And it was like, why are you reading? No, 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 trust what I'm saying. Because well, I understand it more. You haven't been trained. Uh, get in your own which is, which is how so many of the abuses yeah. entered into the church was yeah. because of that very thinking. Right. Widen your hearts. I, that, I feel like that needs, you know, you see verses printed on walls and pillows and blankets. I feel like <laughs> I want to have that one somewhere. Yeah. Widen your hearts. I'd never really noticed it until no, I was looking no. at this, and I'm yeah, like, that's awesome. our heart is wide open in return. Widen your hearts. Yeah. All right, let's go to our gospel lesson here. Love that Job, Job and Paul connection there, Dick. That's, I'm going to hold on to that one. That one, might, that one might show up in a sermon someday. Unless Gordon does it before I do. <laughs> All right, here's Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Profound story here. Jesus calms a storm. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke up him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? All right, guys, I got to admit, I didn't see the connection until just now between the Job text and this text and how much of a connection there is of almost like God saying to Job, why are you so afraid? I'm the creator. I put all this stuff in place. Where's your faith? And you fast forward to this. I'm in the boat with you. Why are you so afraid? What are your thoughts on this, Gordon? Oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> I, this was... This was the major part of the lesson on Thursday in my Bible class, ah. and which I repeated on Sunday in my Bible class. So uh, Ray Vanderlaan, in his That the World May Know, we did a major part on just this story. There is so much stuff in here and so many weird connections, you know. But Jesus has been teaching by the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, the home of many of the scholars of those days. And most of the people there knew their Bibles so well, they had, they had it memorized. And when he gets done teaching them by the sea, he says, let's go across to the other side. Wow. The other side is the Decapolis, the Gentile pagan region on the east side of the Sea of Galilee that nobody goes to. It's the part where normal Jews would not go there because that's evil and we need to keep ourselves holy and pure for God and we're not even going to venture over there. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, okay, all you Bible believers, it's now time for us to go over and and approach the pagans because we need to drive out the demons there because he'd driven out a demon in the synagogue at Capernaum just before this. 
And now he's, it's like, we're going to need to go do that. Uh, the, abyss, the sea was also considered to be the abyss, the place of evil. And so just going out onto the sea, I mean, these were fishermen. They knew that. Sure. But when the windstorm blows up and these, fish, these you know, uh, very veteran fishermen are scared to death. You know it's a legit storm. You know it's a legit yeah. storm. Uh, there's another interesting thing. Other boats were with him in verse 36. It wasn't one boat. Now, why would that be important? So that there were witnesses to this. Mm -hmm. So that people would see that. Ray Vanderlaan thought, he said, made an interesting suggestion. Where did the storm come from? That it was so violent and so bad. It's like Satan saw Jesus coming and stirred up the storm to keep him away. Like, don't come into my neighborhood. This don't come into my story. property, man. And what does Jesus do? He gets over there, and he drives out the man with a legion of demons, mm. which is our lesson this Thursday. Very good. So, I mean, well, there's some more. <laughs> but anyway, I'll let you guys talk. I'll let you guys talk because there's some really cool things here. Yeah, I want to I hear more of that. I, the one thing I would add, a little different, um, is just that I really see Jesus' humanity in the very beginning. He was exhausted. Well, yeah. You know, if, if he is just, if he is only spirit, if he's only God and not man, he can go all day long. Right. You know, energize your buddy. Right. But he was, he was absolutely worn out and fell asleep immediately. In fact, so tired that with the storm going on, he's still sleeping. So that, that helps give me an additional connection to Christ about the man that he was in addition to my Lord and God. I found that very helpful. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast that the seminary does and they do it to help pastors, a lot of soul pastors at churches and it's called Le uh, lectionary kickstart. And they do the reading that's like two Sundays ahead. So the, you, know, you can read it and then write your sermon. And anyways, they were talking about this and, I don't know how deep this observation is by the two guys, but I found it humorous how, like verse 36, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat. Like he's some kind of side bag, like he's a suitcase. Like they took him with them versus, I mean, that's God. It's God in the flesh. But it's such an interesting, casual yeah. thing. Wow. They took him with them in the boat just as he was. Because he's not the sailor, he's not the fisherman. But it's very interesting how it. He he's seems just like the a, stowaway. It seems like a stowaway. <laughs> it seems like a side piece or something. Like, yeah, well, well, you can come along. And yet it's, and then and then before you know it, they're crying out in dependence, Lord save us. Not that they were being arrogant, but I just thought that was a funny thing how those guys brought that up. Of, well, and as you mentioned right prior, you said this is the Job connection. Mm -hmm. Do you not see that we are perishing? That's, a, that's what Job was yeah. saying to yeah. God. Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care we're about to drown? I think different translations have it. Yeah. And we get that way when we're having those very difficult, difficult times. Sure. Do you not see what I'm going through? And also, like, I got to think God goes, because, like, we, we say that a lot of times because we have this fear. Like, like, say you're really sick. Lord, do you not see I'm dying? Yeah. And God's like, do you not know what I have waiting for you? Like, why are you so afraid to die? I've promised you this eternal life. Not that, not that anyone's ready to check out soon, but like, do you not know what I have waiting for you when you die? Don't fear death. Don't, don't, uh, and it's a natural human re response, mourning, get it. But like, if we knew what, I mean, if we had a real true grasp of what, I think we'd be more at peace with illness and death and all this stuff if we could, Get a greater grasp of what is to come. That we're here just for a moment. Right. Well, we have and, eternity ahead of us. Right? Yeah, and don't forget, there's another time when the disciples are on the lake in a storm, and Jesus is praying on the, the hill after feeding 5,000, mm. and he waits till 4 o'clock in the morning and lets them struggle all night in the boat before he goes walking across the water, going to go past them, and they see him and think it's a ghost. And, of course, Peter says, hey, let me come out. Right. And Peter walks in the water and that whole thing. But the idea that he's sitting there seeing them struggle all night until 4 o'clock in the morning. He knew they were in trouble. 
but he also knew they were okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't time. Mm-hmm. Which again speaks to that whole time thing. Yeah. That's the time the, and the waiting and the patience on God. And he, he don't, it's not, it, we might think that he doesn't care. He doesn't know, but he does, but yeah. it's not the right time. Right. So they, uh, there's a whole thing about sleeping on the cushion, a big debate about what is the cushion. And I don't even know the answer to that, but just, there is a debate on well, whether a that's a boat. whether it that's a piece a, of whether that's a piece of the boat, a section of the boat, or whether it was actually like a pillow that he was sleeping on. You know, that's debatable. But I think it's, that. But to me, it goes back to what you were saying about he was a fully human being. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm tired. I got to sleep. Where would I sleep? Ah, on the cushion. On the cushion. Not yeah, on the, the oh. hard wood of the boat. <laughs> right. Um, but then when. He gets done, peace be still, the, the winds calm down, and they're filled with great fear. And they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Why would they respond like that? Because they knew the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Because Psalm 107, 28 and 29 says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Or if, or if they could gone back and gone, oh, remember Job? Yeah. Job, whatever we just read, God said he, he created all this and hymns it all in and keeps it all in contained and controls it all. The two natures of Christ are on full display. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. Divine and human. This is a story where you can be tempted to gloss over it. Oh yeah. I'll admit when I when I was I was reading the other ones in prep for this and I saw Jesus calm the storm. Ah, I know that. And we can do that with scripture. But as we just showed here, when you actually sit in it and think about it and contemplate the connections, there's richness in it. And there's a reason why we keep going back to these stories over and over and over and over. And, over. and I think that's the power in having the three lessons. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and what, how it's so important. This whole thing that's been put together, this this three uh, three year lectionary, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Scripture interprets scripture. It does. Yeah. So there's another very interesting thing that Ray Vanderlaan brought up. Compare this to Jonah. Interesting. Uh, go go okay. on. Both of them are given a mission to God. Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to the pagan world. Jesus going across the sea to the Decapolis. A great storm arises in both of them. They both are asleep in the, in the middle of the storm. The sailors or the disciples wake them up and saying, don't you care that we're about ready to drown? Jesus, the sea is calm. Jesus says, be still. Nineveh is thrown overboard, and the sea is calmed. And uh, they're both buried for three days. Jesus in the tomb and Jonah in the fish. The main difference? Jesus wanted to go to the pagans. Jonah went the opposite direction away from it. He didn't want to be on that mission. Yeah. And, and what, I, as, what came to mind to me when you were speaking that is those guys had peace in that moment because Christ was there. He brought them peace. Whereas Jonah was in the belly of fish. No peace there. Nope. And not only in, in I don't know that he ever found, <clears throat> even when he was puked up on the shore, and then still had to go to Nineveh. And even then he was not happy because right. they did repent and he didn't want them to. He wanted God to kill him with lightning so and was whatever. Lacking, lacking peace, lacking peace, lacking peace. But yet now that we have Christ and the Messiah has come, we have this unique peace that Jonah didn't have. Right. The Old Testament didn't have because they're constantly waiting for the Messiah. Right. Messiah, the incarnate Messiah. What was it? Reading this? Someone incarnate. Was that the we were talking about this morning, this morning yes, in, our, yes. in our class? The, in, the incarnate something. I don't. I, I'm I'm rambling here, but something about the incarnate man, Christ, came here. Happened. Well, that's what incarnate means in yeah, flesh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was trying to draw forward the yeah. phrase that the book used. It was a very unique phrase, but it's skipping my brain now. But the fact that Christ has come in the flesh makes us different than those before, and so in that we have this different hope, this different peace, this different mission of sharing that with the world. Any closing thoughts on this? Very good. Uh, 
Okay. No, I think that the who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. It can only be one. It can only be the creator. Yeah, or who is this yeah. that he dies for me and pays my penalty? Right. Like only you put it in today's context, who is this that has gone to prison for me for the murder I committed? Who is this? Yep. Radical, ridiculous love. Yep. Only one. All right, folks, thanks for joining us this week. Come worship with us this Sunday, every Sunday, 8, 30, 11, Bible study in between. Uh, we have lots of classes, and that is one of the places where um, the fellowship of believers is so rich. So I would encourage you, find a class here at OSL. Holler at me or any one of these guys. We'll be happy to uh, show you into a class and get you connected. All right, y'all have a good one. We'll catch you next time.